uh, new creation and a new Jerusalem and, and, and epilogue. But if you remember last week, we only got uh, three of the four chapters done last week. So we have to, we have to uh, go back and do chapter 20, which is a good, a good thing, actually, it turns out. Uh, a couple of the readings this morning at church uh, deal with chapter 20, well, peripherally deal with chapter 20 out of uh, Revelation. So, so this is good. So we'll start with uh, the sixth site out of the seven sites, uh, Revelation chapter 20. Let's get rid of the Norwegian cruise line ad. <laughs> I'm probably getting that ad because Pat's going to Norway next year. Okay, chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding, his, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him, so that he would deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. I'll talk about this. Um, this uh, the interpretation of this is problematic. Uh, first of all, the thousand years, uh, those of us who are progressive Christians treat that as symbolic, not a literal thousand years, although many of our conservative evangelical brothers and sisters uh, interpret that literally as a literal thousand years, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. Um, this is problematic even among those folks because um, the, we're, we're, we'll be talking about uh, three or four passages here in a row. The next passage we'll be talking about uh, the uh, reign of Christ and the martyrs on earth. And because of that last sentence in this passage, there's a question about uh, whether they interpret that as the reign of Christ coming after the devil is let out for a little while or before. Whether this last sentence is sort of a preview of what happens after the ne next passage or whether it happens before. So it's confusing and I'll go over the various alternative interpretations in a bit. Okay, um, it, the passage men, uh, mentions a chain. Let's see a couple of places where uh, in scripture that where a chain is mentioned. Uh, Second Peter uh, chapter two, verse four, and Jude, verse six. For if, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, or here is in Jude, and the angels who did not keep their own position but deserted their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal change in deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. That's referring to the uh, casting down the angels out of heaven. Um, a thousand years, we interpret this as a symbolic number. As I said, not everybody takes it symbolically. This is from Psalm 90. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. The next section, next uh, verses uh, four, five, and six, are about the reign of Christ and the martyrs. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. 
I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its brand on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So here's Re Revelation is talking about two resurrections. Strange, huh? The first resurrection is the resurrection of the martyrs. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over, over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. So is this thousand years the same thousand years in which the devil is imprisoned? Well, that's a good question. The second death is the condemnation to eternal fire. The first death is the earthly death. The second death is the condemnation to eternal fire. So points to remember about this uh, section. Thrones, some references from Daniel, uh, Matthew, and Luke. From Daniel, as I watched, thrones were set in place and an ancient one took his throne, his clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. More from Daniel, until the Ancient One came, then judgment was given for the Holy Ones of the Most High, and the time arrived when the Holy Ones gained possession of the kingdom. See, John in Revelation borrows quite a bit from Daniel, even more from Ezekiel. You've probably gathered that from all the quotes from Ezekiel. The kingship and dominion of the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Here's something from Matthew. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here's something from Luke, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's a parallel passage from the Matthew a passage I just read. Those beheaded for their testimony. We've heard about these martyrs before, back in chapter 6 of Revelation. As a reminder, I'll read a couple of verses from chapter 6. When he broke, the, remember the seven seals, when he broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered for the word of God and for the testimony they had given. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? So here's their time. Their time has come and they are resurrected and will rule with Christ on earth, according to this passage. Reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now I mentioned that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm including you all in this uh, description, my description of progressive Christians. The ELCA tends to be a progressive bunch and uh, uh, we uh, tend to interpret revelation uh, symbolically so the thousand years uh, we uh, tend to uh, tend to take uh, metaphorically, uh, not exactly a thousand years, but uh, symbolically as a very long time. But our con conservative evangelical brothers and sisters often in interpret Revelation uh, literally and uh, and and and, and as a, exactly a thousand years which gives rise to what's called Christian millennialism. <clears throat> you might have heard people talk about the millennium, the thousand years. Now, don't confuse that with the description of young people called millennials, right? That's a completely separate concept. 
Millennials refer, of course, to the year 2000, young people born uh, around the year 2000. This, is, this, this millennialism refers to the thousand year reign of Christ, okay? Um, and because of the amb ambiguity in th these passages in Revelation, there are even among the conservative evangelicals, there's a, 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 a variation in how this, how this lays out, how the timeline lays out. So let me, let me show you some of the various interpretations. I'm going to blow this up here so it make it easier to see because this printing is tiny. All right. <clears throat> Comparison of Christian millennial teachings. I'm going to skip down to the last one first because these first ones are very complicated. And the last one is simple. That's one reason. Second reason is be it's because this is what we believe, amillennialism, which literally means no millennium. Um, the cross on the left is when Jesus came the first time, when Christ came the first time, right? Um, and on the right is eternity, right? And there's a second coming and last judgment over there. Remember what we sometimes confess in our church services. Uh, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. You, you, you've heard it, you've recited that, right? Well, that's pretty much it. That's what we believe, right? There's, we don't have any thousand year reign or the martyrs ruling or it, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And that's what this picture is about. Uh, if, we, if we talk about a millennium, it's a symbolic millennium. The mess messianic age started when, G when, when Christ was here the first time. And the messianic age will end when Christ comes the second time. And that's it. It's very simple. But there are some people who make it very complicated. So I'm going to go up now and we'll start through these, belief, these millennial beliefs. Uh, the first division is between premillennialism and postmillennialism. <clears throat> uh, the difference between those two is when the second coming is going to happen. Is it going to come before the thousand years? That's premillennialism. Or is it the second coming going to happen after the thousand years? That's postmillennialism. Now, even among premillennialism, there are two kinds. Post-tribulational premillennialism, that, in that kind, the second coming happens after the tribulation, the great tribulation. So you can see the timeline here. There is a great tribulation which comes from a passage in Matthew. There's a, there, there's, there are two chapters in Matthew, 24 and 25. We heard a passage in church this morning from the beginning of Matthew 25 about the wise and foolish young women with the lamps, or the oil lamps. That's from the beginning of chapter 25. That's part of a, part of a section called the Olivet Discourse. Uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they ask, they, it starts out, the disciples ask him about the end times. Uh, Lord, when will this be, and how will we know? So Jesus tells them. This, this happens in all three Gospels, but the one in Matthew is the most extensive. So Jesus talks to them in apocalyptic language about the end times. And it's full of all kinds of um, sometimes rather frightful uh, uh, events that Jesus tells them is going to happen during the end times. And this uh, is sometimes called the Great Tribulation. So, post-tribulational premillennialism, the tribulation, this tribulation happens toward the end times, then there's the second coming, and Christ rules then for a thousand years, and then there's the last judgment. All right, another kind of premillennialism is, and I think, as far as I know, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't have any inside knowledge into the um, uh, conservative evangelical uh, crowd, 
But it, it seems to me that this uh, number two here is the uh, most uh, popular belief among those folks. Pre-tribulational post-millennialism, sometimes called dispensational premillennialism, uh, because there are multiple opportunities to be saved in this type of uh, premillennialism. The first opportunity to be saved is the rapture. You may have heard about that. That's the first, <laughs> the first second coming. Second coming, it will, it will be, uh, people will be raptured and uh, the believers are, will be taken away from the earth and will avoid the great tribulation. But during the tribulation will be an opportunity for those who are left to repent so that at the, at the second, second coming, there will be an opportunity for more people to be saved who have repented during the tribulation, okay? <clears throat> so then there's a second, second coming with the church, and this is the second coming that's, that, that we see in Revelation chapter 20. So there's, then there's the reign of Christ on earth with the martyrs that I just read to you, and then the last judgment. Uh, Tim. <laughs> where I mean, to, to, where, where, you're asking where is today in this chart? Well, I think we're after tribulation. But we, 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 we have not started the tribulation yet. Or, yeah, Luann asks, are you sure? <laughs> well, I don't know for sure. <laughs> We don't, we don't, we don't know. Maybe, maybe we've started with all, with all of the wars today in various parts of the world. Maybe, maybe we have started the tribulation. Uh, have, have, have you noticed anybody suddenly disappearing? Because the rapture has to happen before the great tribulation. I mean, if that has happened, oh my, we're all still here. <laughs> yeah. Any, anyway. I, 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 just, I sort of like being a Lutheran. It's a whole lot simpler. Uh, anyway, okay, that's two kinds of premillennialism. But then the, there's uh, another kind of millennialism called postmillennialism, in which uh, Christ will rule on earth uh, for a thousand years. And then, um, well, I guess. Christ is not going to rule on earth. Christ will rule from heaven for a thousand years. There will be a thousand years of peace and tranquility because Christ is ruling from heaven. And then Christ will come, the second coming and the last judgment. I, I can't tell you wh which denominations believe this particular uh, post-millennialism, but there is that belief that, that there will be a period of peace and tranquility when Christ rules from heaven for a while before uh, the second coming. Okay, <clears throat> that's a lot to take in, but I wanted you to be aware that there are, when you hear talk of the millennium or the thousand year reign, uh, that's what this is all, that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah, you. I, I, I think I probably lost some folks in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, don't, don't. Uh, there's, there won't be a test on any of this, so don't worry about it. Just, it, it, Lutherans generally believe number four there, uh, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's, that, that's, that's us. Now, Satan has to be released for a little while. And again, of course, we as progressive Christians generally read Revelation as symbolic. Just a reminder. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog in order to gather them for battle. 
They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that's the last of the devil. The devil is defeated. Gog and Magog. Uh, now, uh, John didn't dream this up on his own. Let's look at Ezekiel. But John borrowed an awful lot from Ezekiel. Ezekiel has quite a bit of apocalyptic language, right? So uh, John borrowed from Ezekiel, also from Daniel. So let's take a look at Ezekiel. Mortal, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief pri prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, even Ezekiel did some borrowing here. Turns out, in Genesis, we read, this is amongst the uh, genealogy back in, in Genesis. The descendants of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiroth. Japheth was one of the sons of Noah, Shem, Han, and, Ham, and Japheth. So one of the, so the sons of Japheth, uh, among them, were Magog, Tubal, and Meshach, which, uh, which uh, uh, Ezekiel talked about, and, um, and, uh, and uh, John in, um, in Revelation borrows uh, Magog from these earlier authors. The beloved city, of course, is Jerusalem. Fire. John talks a lot about fire coming down from heaven in several places. And of course, we going back to Ezekiel again. But also, there's a passage in 2 Kings I want to read about. Uh, from Ezekiel, with pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will pour down torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur upon him and his troops and the many peoples who are with him. Again, from Ezekiel, here's Magog again. I will send fire on Magog and all on those who live securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord. This is from 2 Kings, chapter 1, verse 9. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of the 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Well, that wasn't very nice of Elijah, was it? Again, the king sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up and said to him, O man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. But Elijah answered him, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire uh, of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Um, then it, the story goes on, and um, the king sent another contingent up there. And the, this time, the, the, the third captain was scared to death. Well, rightly so. So the third captain fell down on his knees and pleaded with Elijah, please don't kill me. <coughs> and and, and uh, the third captain said, uh, if, if you have it in you, would you please come down with us because the king wants to see you. See, the, the story was the king uh, had an accident. He fell down and, and was seriously injured. 
and <coughs> he wanted a, a prophet to come to him and tell him whether he was going to recover or die from his injury. Well, that's the background here. This was the, the king of the, of the north, in northern Israel, after Israel and Judah split into two kingdoms. So uh, he wanted Elijah to come and tell him, tell, tell him what was going to happen to him. So the, the third captain, after he was, spoke very nicely to Elijah, uh, Elijah came and went with him to the king. Now, this is a funny story if you know Hebrew. There's a play on words in this story that works only in Hebrew, so I gotta tell you about this. This is good. The play on words is that man of God, which the captain is calling out, in Hebrew is Ish Elohim. Fire of God is Esh Elohim. So when the captain was mean to Elijah, Elijah pretended to be hard of hearing. <laughs> and when the captain was nice to him, suddenly Elijah's hearing improved. That's the joke. It's like, um, I'm not surprised that there, were, that, that there were so many Jewish comics because the Hebrew language is almost tailor-made for making jokes in that way. The seventh sight. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works as recounted in the books, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and all, who were judged, and all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So this is the second re resurrection. The first were, were the martyrs, and this, the second is everybody else. Great white throne. No, we are not talking about a bathroom here. <laughs> We've seen thr thr thrones before in Revelation, a couple of times, chapter 4 and earlier in chapter 20. Reminder. At once I was in the spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne with one seated on the throne. And earlier in chapter 20, then I saw thrones and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its brand on their forehead or hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So that, that those are of course the martyrs. Book of Deeds, borrowed from Daniel chapter seven. Chapter seven in Daniel is the first apocalyptic book in Daniel. First six chapters of Daniel are folk tales. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den, the young men in the fiery furnace, etc. cetera. Uh, chapters seven through 12 are apocalyptic. And uh, John borrows a lot from those six chapters, final six chapters of Daniel. <coughs> A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The, store, the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Supposedly the books of the deeds of everyone. The Book of Life. This is a separate book, not one of the Book of Deeds. Uh, 
Apparently that book contains just names of those who are going to be saved. Judge according to their works. Martin Luther must have had a fit. <coughs> but there are supporting verses in the rest of the Bible, as long as you take the verses out of context. Uh, now, I'll have to admit, I hope you don't think that I know enough about the Bible to pull all of these references out of my head. I have a stack of reference books uh, that these references come, come out of. So one of my reference, one or more of my reference books uh, produced these uh, references to support judgment by works. So I'm going to tell them to you and then show you why it's exactly the wrong thing to do, okay? Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing in Romans, if you can believe it. Chapter 2, verse 6, he will repay according to each one's deeds. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, again, Paul. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive due recompense for actions done in the body, whether good or evil. So what do, do all of you good Lutherans think about this? <laughs> Martin Luther must have had a fit. Okay, here's why you shouldn't take a single verse out of context and say, well, that settled the matter. It never settles the matter. This verse from Matthew, uh, repay every one for what has been done. This is the ending verse of the, pack of the passage that starts out with, Jesus telling his disciples, the Son of Man must travel to Jerusalem and be put to death. And Peter says, you got to stop talking like that, Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because Peter's speaking the words of the devil, right? So, so Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're getting in my way. You need to let me fulfill the mission for which I was sent here. So Peter is essentially doing an evil deed. And that's the context in which Jesus says this at the end of that passage. I think you can probably understand a little bit uh, the, the frame of mind that Jesus is when he says, he will repay everyone for what has been done. That's the context, okay? A little bit, that little bit of understanding probably sheds some light on why Jesus said that. Because, you know, Peter's getting in, 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 in his way. He says he will repay everyone. I think he, Jesus is, is exercising a little bit of hyperbole here. He's, he's probably directing that more at Peter than anyone else, right? I'm willing to say that Jesus went a little bit over the top at times. Um, let Yeah, there's hope, there's hope, yeah, well, there's hope, yeah, there's hope for everyone, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the Romans 2 passage, he will repay according to each one's deeds. If you read all of chapter 2, the subject is, that Paul is talking about, is what we call today cheap grace. 
And uh, cheap grace is, of course, the feeling that, well, I'm living under God's grace, so I don't have to worry about my behavior. God's going to forgive me whatever I do, so I can do any, whatever I want. And as Paul is saying, no, that's not how this works. And uh, so, again, Paul is emphasizing that there's no such thing as cheap grace. You have freedom under God's grace, but we need to use our freedom to do good things for one another. And that's how, where Paul gets around to saying he will repay each uh, according to each one's deeds. That's the context of, of that verse. So that's the lesson of pulling a single verse out of context and using it, it, it to prove whatever you want to prove. Okay. Yes, you, you got you to be careful about that. Uh, Paul is using this verse, it, Paul is making this statement to show there's no such thing as cheap grace. Okay. I hope that clears up uh, this matter. These verses really don't prove justification by works. Not if you look at the context. Okay, death and Hades, the last enemies to, to be defeated. They, they're sort of per, per, uh, personified here in, in these verses. Um, vision of a new Jerusalem. Renewal of creation. Chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, see, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things. I will be their God and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. <clears throat> a new heaven and a new earth. Well, Isaiah has, has had something to, be, to, to say about that. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. See, John borrows right straight from Isaiah. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. The sea was no more. And that's a good thing. I kind of like to go out to the ocean. <laughs> you have to remember that the Israelites were not seafaring people. And they thought of the sea and the ocean as a place of chaos and turmoil. And that when God created the land and separated it from the sea, that was a good thing, creating order out of chaos. As we go back and look at the uh, creation story again. The earth was complete chaos and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God slept, swept over the face of the waters. And in Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is over the waters and the 
God of glory thunders the Lord over mighty waters. The sea was a symbol of turmoil. So yes, the sea was no more. Well, they thought that was a good thing. Prepared as a bride, again taken from Isaiah. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the, garments of, with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garden, with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Contrast that with the image of Rome as the whore of Babylon. Big contrast. He will wipe away every tear, again taken from Isaiah. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Those who conquer, think back to the letters to the seven churches. Only, I'll, I'll, I'll just read one verse from the first letter. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Remember that word, everyone who conquers, nikon in Greek. Also, the word that the uh, famous athletic apparel company in Beaverton gets its name, right? Nike, Nikon, the one, everyone who conquers, or everyone who is victorious. Nike, the god of victory. <coughs> the vision, measuring of the city. <coughs> Pardon? Oh, no, I'm fine, thank you. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal, it has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates are inscribed uh, the names that are the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, and on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations, and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city has four equal sides, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod. 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the sixth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, the seventh amethyst. And the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the street, the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. What a magnificent image. Both the city and its measurements are symbolic, of course. 12,000 stadia, about 1,500 miles, huge. 144 cubits are 75 yards, roughly. Um, notice 12,000 and 144 are multiples of 12. The bride, the wife, the, the wife of the lamb. Uh, 
Isaiah, from Isaiah and Hosea. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, and the God of the whole earth he is called. Um, Israel was often referred to as the bride of God. And I will, t I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. A high mountain from Ezekiel chapter 40. He brought me in visions of God to the land of Israel and set me down upon a very high mountain on which was a structure like a city to the south. Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Galatians and Hebrews. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. From Hebrews, for he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And the gates of the city from Ezekiel. These shall be the exits of the city on the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure. Three gates, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, the gate of Levi, the gates of the city being named after the tribes of Israel. On the east side, which is to be 4,500 cubits, three gates, the gate of Joseph, the gate of Beth. I'm not going to read the whole thing. The thing is, the, uh, the gates are of equal measure, and they are named for the tribes of Israel. The city lies four square. In other words, it's a perfect square, equal on all sides. I'm not going to read the Ezekiel. You get the idea. All of this is taken from the, uh, the prophet Ezekiel. And the, the gemstones, the stones, these are the same stones that adorn the high priest's breastplate in Exodus. I'm not going to read those either because um, 10 of the 12 stones are the same as the gemstones on the high priest's uh, breastplate in Exodus. The nature of the city. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its, ga its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. No need of sun or moon. From Isaiah again. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor brightness shall the moon give light to you by night, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. You know, John wasn't really very original, was he? <laughs> There's so much borrowed from the prophets. Yes, uh, gates will never be shut. Uh, I, I don't think I really need to read this, do I? It, I mean, it's so much borrowed from uh, the prophets. Um, the river, I do want to read the river. Did I read the river? I think I forgot to read the passage about the river from Revelation 22. Let me go back. Um, I read about the book of life, but I think I forgot to read about... The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. You remember the song, uh, Shall We Gather at the River? The flows from the throne of God? Yes. <coughs> flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb 
through the middle of the street of the city on either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations nothing accursed will be found there anymore but the throne of god and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night they need no lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So, the river. Genesis, Psalms, and Ezekiel. Genesis. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. Psalm, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God and the holy habitation of the Most High. And from Ezekiel 47, he brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There water was flowing from be below the entryway of the temple toward the east. I'm going to skip. This is long, but I want to, want to get to the end. As I came back, I saw on the bank of the river a great many trees on the one side and on the other. Skipping again. On the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for the food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the, the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be, food, will be for food and their leaves for healing. The tree in Revelation is a collective reference to the many trees on each side. And the phrase, see his face, means a, a full awareness of God's presence. There, I have references to, to, to Psalm 10 and Psalm 42. I'm going to run out of time unless I hurry up, though, so I'm going to skip reading those i do want to get to the epilogue <coughs> excuse me and he said to me <coughs> the <coughs> pardon me these words are trustworthy and true for the lord the god of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of the book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay everyone according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so, they will, so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. Let everyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of, the pro of, the, of this prophecy, God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. The one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen, come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. There are two verses there, and it's uh, the, it, it, 
They're not attributed to a speaker, but verse, in verse 6, an angel is speaking. And in verse 7, see, I'm coming soon. Christ is the speaker there. Do not seal this book, because that's because the end is so close. In Isaiah and in Daniel, the author is told to seal up the book so that it's safe until the end time. Here, the book does not need to be sealed because the end is near. My reward is with me in Isaiah and Jeremiah. See, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. Jeremiah, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all, to all according to their ways, according to the fruits of their doings. And notice, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Christ is speaking here, and Christ, remember that's from chapter 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In chapter 1, God is speaking. Here, Christ applies God's title to himself. Blessed. There are seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. This is one of them. Just to recap. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I have that on my title slide. Chapter 14, verse 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Chapter 16, verse 15, see, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. Chapter 19, verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Chapter 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. That's earlier in this chapter about the martyrs. And then the one we are just looking at in verse 7. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So we've reached the end of the book. Uh, it's 12 noon. I had had a couple uh, supplementary slides to show that I was going to call two things that you know about Revelation that are wrong. But I could start with those next time if you want to get going. So maybe we should do that. Um, one is the rapture, the next is the Antichrist, neither of which appear in the book of Revelation. But We'll start with those next time and then do a recap, sort of a summary of the book of Revelation. And then I want to get a discussion going. I'll make up some discussion questions that we can talk about at our tables and then get back together for a group discussion. I'll try to arrange for a second microphone that we can pass around here to make for a, a good discussion. Any comments or anything else that you want to bring up before we break. Okay, thanks. I hope to see you next week for our discussion.